Uh, and what I'd uh, like to say before we get going is that uh, uh, what qualifies me for uh, giving this talk, and uh, there are uh, two or three things that I'll mention. One is I uh, was studying uh, engineering and got three electrical engineering degrees while I was at Stanford many years ago. But uh, that uh, indicated my interest in technical things, particularly having to do with electronics. I also got my ham radio license when I was 12, and I've continued that uh, through, and it's been a major contributor to my career. Most of my practical knowledge comes from ham radio and from uh, the uh, on-the-job training of the number of jobs I've had. So uh, but I wanted to mention that, that uh, I think my experience with uh, electronics and uh, my lifelong uh, career in electrical engineering uh, gives me a different perspective than most people who have hearing loss and who, uh, who end up getting hearing aids and getting cochlear implants. Uh, I was very interested in the technology. I was very interested in the gadgets and the signal processing. And, and uh, from, from where I'm coming from, I understand most of that. Uh, going to the audiologist was always a fun experience for me. Uh, and I think the audiologists appreciated it because I answered or I asked questions uh, that other people didn't uh, ask. So with that, uh, let me uh, go to screen share here. And uh, uh, if I keep looking off to my right, that's because I'm... I have another computer going that enables me to see what you see, because when you're giving a talk using screen share, you don't see what uh, the audience uh, is seeing. And uh, so I can never tell whether um, I'm on screen and that kind of thing. And then I gotta get rid of that floating thing. So, um, this is my story. Uh, Janie came up with a longer title for this, but uh, this is my story of getting a cochlear implant and losing my hearing before that. So I'd like to start with, uh, let's see here, get my controls back, uh, with a few requests. One, I'd, I'd like you to hold questions, if you will, to be taken at the end of the presentation please do not use Zoom chat during the presentation because that causes little pop-ups at the bottom, which uh, are very distracting. And I'd like all of you to mute your microphones uh, right now so that uh, if your dog barks, your phone rings, or uh, uh, your spouse or, or kids come in to talk to you, uh, that won't uh, come through to the uh, meeting. So let me talk about my hearing loss progression. I first started uh, suspecting I had hearing loss back way back in October 2002. And I think under my uh, advice of my uh, general practitioner at that time, I, I uh, went, made an appointment at the Palo Alto Medical Foundation with an audiologist uh, who recommended hearing aids. Uh, but I felt more like she was trying to sell me hearing aids than she said I had very mild uh, hearing loss, but I would uh, probably benefit from hearing aids. And I wasn't really ready to admit I maybe was getting old and losing my hearing. But in September 2008, uh, with increasing hearing loss, I scheduled another test with the audiologist at PAM. And that test, uh, six years later, showed that I experienced significant hearing loss. And my Mary, uh, my wife and my our eldest son, Dan, and the audiologist were in un un unanimous agreement that I needed hearing aids. So in October 2008, a month later, I purchased my first hearing aids from Costco. 
Five years after that, four and a half years, I purchased a second pair of hearing aids from Costco. And I'll say, it, I wasn't purchasing new hearing aids because the old ones weren't working, but the technology was evolving rather quickly. And uh, uh, like I mentioned, I'm very interested in technology and I wanted to have the latest uh, features. And then uh, uh, three years, so years after that, I purchased my third pair of hearing aids from Costco and uh, they weren't working very well for me. So uh, a few months later, I went back to Costco for a hearing aid judge uh, saying, you know, they, they really don't work very well. And the audiologist, well, the technician there uh, uh, gave me a test and uh, he measured profound hearing loss. He said it wasn't possible to correct for uh, the level of hearing loss that I had. And he recommended I visit my ear, nose and throat doctor to uh, find out what was going on. So in December of 2017, I uh, went to Palo Alto Medical Foundation, uh, had a test from an audiologist, which uh, confirmed the profound hearing loss. Uh, and it's interesting in that test that the, uh, audi the audiologist actually terminated the test early because he was afraid uh, he, in order to test my hearing uh, and make the, uh, the, the uh, stimulus loud enough uh, that he would be doing more damage to my hearing. So uh, that to me was worrisome. 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 Uh, so, Kathy, you may, yeah, uh, thank you. Um, so, uh, let me talk a little bit about, uh, and, and I apologize to those of you who uh, know all this already, but uh, there may be some people here that don't know the levels of hearing loss in their classifications. This is an audiogram that uh, uh, typical of what a audiologist would produce or the Costco technician. And uh, <clears throat> it's on the left side, uh, across the top is the frequency uh, that you're being tested at. Uh, and down the left side is the uh, hearing loss in decibels. Uh, 10 dB uh, is a factor of 10. That is, if uh, if, if someone had a uh, hearing loss that was 10 dB, the signal that uh, they would require uh, to hear a particular frequency would be 10 times louder than a normal hearing person would hear. Now, you'll notice in this one, they, they consider anything from 20 dB uh, hearing loss to even minus 10, uh, which indicates there are some people who have, actually have hearing that's better than considered normal. Uh, mild hearing loss, uh, moderate hearing loss, and severe hearing loss. Profound hearing loss is 90 dB. Uh, and, and there's, I'll show you in the next slide, there's some uh, uh, differences in the way audiologists plot this. But they all agree that if you have hearing loss of 90 dB or more, that's profound. Here's a, another uh, definition. You'll notice here that they've added slight uh, to mild and moderately se severe to moderate. Uh, but again, uh, anything greater than 90 dB is considered severe hearing loss. Well, here's my my audiograms uh, from the Palo Alto Medical Foundation. And the date of this exam was December 15, uh, 2017. It also shows the data from my previous exam, which was November 4th, 2014. Can you see my cursor? Uh, and you'll notice that uh, in the, the dark circles, which are my, uh, the previous test, uh, all of these are within the range that they can be corrected by uh, hearing aids or overcome. 
Uh, but in the one uh, with the X's and the open circles uh, was the, the latest test. And you'll notice that on my left ear, uh, he quit testing me at uh, about 750 hertz uh, and just said my hearing loss was essentially infinity above that. My right ear is a little better, but even above... Uh, about 1500 hertz, uh, it was uh, uncorrectable. Un now, just for reference, the human voice typically is in the range of 250 to 500 hertz, which is, on this uh, scale goes up to about here. Um, I, what did I say? 250 to 5000 hertz. I'm sorry, it's up, up to around here someplace. Uh, and the the importance, if if you lose your hearing a, hearing above, uh, say seven hundred and fifty or a thousand hertz, you're missing all of the consonants in speech. Uh, below you're hearing the voice, but above you're hearing the consonants. You can't distinguish uh, a T from a V from a D, uh, and it makes it very difficult to understand. Uh, conversations and speech. Uh, for preference, te the telephone bandwidth of a typical telephone is 300 to 3400 hertz, which is considered uh, adequate for our speech. Well, the next thing was I was recommended to get a cochlear implant by the uh, ENT at, uh, at uh, AMF. And our insurance coverage for myself and my wife, uh, Mary, uh, is, a, is a health net Medicare Advantage insurance plan that's managed by Palo Alto Medical Foundation. Uh, Palo Alto Medical Foundation didn't do cochlear implant surgery at the time uh, I was recommended for it. Uh, so they preferred, they referred their patients to Stanford uh, ear clinic, ear institute, which was out of the PAMF network and required approvals. Uh, to my amazement, PAMF moved surprisingly quickly in getting the approvals to Stanford. To track the progression of getting the cochlear implant, uh, December 19, 2017, which was just uh, a month after uh, the ENT recommended I get a cochlear implant, uh, PAMF, uh, Stanford got the PAMF ref uh, referral for me to have a cochlear implant or it, to have testing to confirm my C uh, cochlear implant eligibility. And then in February 15, 2018, the Stanford audiologist and ENT confirmed that I qualified for uh, coverage and uh, cochlear implants in both ears, which requires by Medicare in-sentence word recognition of less than 40%. My scores were 36% in my right ear and 8% in my left ear which meant I actually qualified for a cochlear implant at that time in both ears. But of course, no, they would never do two ears at, at a time. So uh, we picked the, the right ear, or uh, sorry, the left ear to have a cochlear implant. Uh, in April, PAMF approved the cochlear implant surgery at Stanford in 2018. And then uh, uh, they, Hope, since I had some residual low frequency hearing, they hoped to preserve the low frequency hearing uh, in, in the ear where they did the transplant. Uh, PAMF had already done an MRI uh, to, to confirm that my hearing loss wasn't being caused by a, a tumor or some other problem and that I would likely benefit from a cochlear implant. Uh, but Stanford, the surgeon wanted a CAT scan uh, to get the bone structure. He didn't need to get the soft tissue information because uh, he had that from the PAMF uh, MRI. 
but uh, they want to know before they go in uh, and in insert this cochlear implant uh, what they may be facing if there's anything unusual about the bone structure. So the, the surgery was scheduled then for June 11th, 2018 at the Stanford Lane Surgery Center, which is on the Stanford campus. And let me describe the progression of the surgery. Uh, Mary took me there. We arrived at about 6.30 in the morning uh, for all the preliminaries. Uh, and she, Mary stayed with me through the preparations. Uh, we met the anesthesiologist. Uh, this was to be done with the general anesthetic. Uh, the nurses and the technicians who would uh, be in the uh, in the operating room with me. Uh, I had met the surgeon before, and uh, uh, we were pretty much ready to go. Uh, let me mention that this is the first time I'd ever had a general anesthetic and I was nervous. I'd had uh, a uh, uh, colonoscopy where they don't use a general anesthetic, but it's kind of a strong sedative. And I had a very bad anesthetic hangover from that. So I felt underwater uh, for a couple of weeks and I mentioned that. <laughs> And that went on my record that I'd had this bad uh, reaction to that anesthetic. Uh, so they were very reassuring that that wasn't going to happen again. But having never had surgery before, I must admit, it, I was a little concerned, nervous. In any case, uh, I was rolled into the operating room at 8.15 and I was uh, rolled out, although I was asleep at the time at about 10. And that's typical for this procedure that it's a 90 to 120 minute procedure, depending on the, the device they're installing and the, uh, uh, the bone structure and so forth that is uh, uh, being confronted. I was in recovery for about two hours. I felt fine when I woke up and Mary joined me. We received instructions for the care of the incision and for a prescription for a pain medication. I, I was surprised that uh, the only, they, there was bandages over the incision and then they, there was a foam cup that was sort of uh, tied to my head uh, loosely with an elastic uh, band. And uh, I was supposed to wear that for 24 hours. And after 24 hours, I could remove it, uh, the bandages and the cup. And then the incision site was to be kept dry for 72 hours. Uh, so I wore a, a shower cap when I took showers. And Mary drove me home at about noon. The recovery, I had little or no pain at all. I took Tylenol once never got the pain prescription filled, and I had no anesthesia hangover at all. I slept okay every night, showered using the shower cap for the first three days. And after, I think it was a week of surgery, uh, we had a follow-up with a nurse just to see if everything was healing okay. And she removed a suture that had not dissolved uh, but that was not much of a complication. And then they wanted to allow two to three weeks to let things heal before they, you go see the audiologist to have this external processor activated. Uh, so in the meantime, I wore my hearing aids to be able to communicate. Then activation, occurred June 29, 2018. This was uh, two weeks after the surgery. Uh, met with the Stanford audiologist and she gave me the processor. She wanted to see me put it on without any help, which I did. And uh, I could immediately understand everything my wife said, 
the audiologist said, and there was a resident in the uh, room uh, training to be an audiologist, uh, and I could understand everything she said uh, without my hearing aids. Now, that was amazing. <laughs> and I, I really did consider it a miracle. And I, I want to point out that the, all the people I were listening to, I was listening to at this time, were women. And it's always been more difficult once I started uh, losing my hearing to understand women com as compared to men. Um, so it, it, I could hear, understand perfectly and hear, except everything sounded funny. Everybody sounded sort of like a combination of Donald Duck and the Chipmunks, really strange. But I could understand what they were saying. The audiologist, audiologist, audiologist assured me that uh, people would sound natural after time and with practice. <clears throat> she adjusted the cochlear implant processor that is on the outside uh, and adjusted the frequency response like it was the same thing that they do for hearing aids uh, as you get those adjusted. She tested me with various sounds and words and was very pleased with the results. She suggested that I do exercises to train my brain for this new way of hearing. And a follow-up uh, appointment was scheduled one week later. So online exercise that uh, the audiologist had recommended uh, was useful to learn and recognize and practice uh, understanding letters and words and hearing them properly. The most useful thing to me was to listen to audio books while I simultaneously had the hard copy book. Uh, and I listened to different books with different narrators, different voices, men and women. Some had accents, some had uh, very different cadences in the way they spoke, but in a surprisingly short period of time, it was all sounding very natural. We had a follow-up appointment on July 6th, uh, and I was tested using what they call the Ling Sound ID test. This is where they see, can you identify M as in me, U as in U, A as in Ka, E, E, E as in C, and the S, H as in wish. I did 100% on that, uh, I aced it. And then on the Spondee ID test, uh, which is recognition of common words uh, using consonants, I also got 100%. They then tested me on monosyllabic, monosyllabic word ID, and I scored 90% with the right ear plugged. Uh, and the non-sentence comp comp comprehension, which I uh, had a 95% with the right ear plugged. This is compared to the 8% that I had before a cochlear implant. Subsequent audiologist appointments were uh, uh, in August, uh, October of 2018, in May and uh, September of 2019, where it, like with hearing aids, they continued to uh, test and to optimize and, and tailor the uh, processing for my me and my preferences. And then after the September test, the audiologist said she didn't really think uh, I needed any more help and that I should come back if I uh, needed to. And I haven't been back since, although I probably should have been. And I'm planning on going back uh, shortly because I've been using the same processors uh, for over five years now. And the uh, the Medicare will cover updates, uh, new processors and so forth uh, every five years. 
it was uh, interesting that uh, uh, during that time, I think I'm probably two or three releases behind in terms of technology. And of course, I'm anxious to get the, the latest uh, things. So what's implanted? What's actually underneath this skin? Uh, there's a coil which receives power and audio uh, from the external processor via inductive coupling. There's a magnet in the internal uh, implant that couples to another magnet on the external processor to hold the processor in place. There's an electronics module underneath the skin which transmits audio to the uh, electrode array and an electrode array that's inserted into the cochlea to stimulate nerves that no longer receive sound vibration because of the lost cochlea hairs. Electrode arrays typically have 16 to 24 electrodes and 12 to 22 channels, that is wires running into the electrode array. Some of the electrodes are connected in pairs. Mine has 24 electrodes and 12 channels, but this varies between manufacturers and models. The implant has no internal battery. Power is provided by the external processor, the inductive coupling. The magnet in the MedL implants does not need to be removed for most MRI exams, and they were the first to, to have that feature. I think the other manufacturers probably offer it as well now. Uh, here's a, a picture of what I'm talking about, and I thought I fixed this. Um, these, uh, these are two figures that are overlapping, and uh, I won't try to fix it now, but uh, basically, uh, this is the inductive coil here. In the center is the magnet, uh, and this is under the skin. The elect electronics are here, and then this is the electrode array. Uh, the electrode array going that goes into the cochlea. Uh, they try to make this as flexible as possible so that when they feed it into the cochlea, it doesn't uh, break off a lot more of the hairs that are remaining. Uh, in general, I discovered after the surgery that that only works about, well, in, in, normally uh, the residual hearing will be damaged so that you lose about 25% of it uh, as a result of the surgery. But this is very small. This uh, across this coil is about an inch diameter uh, and you can see they're very thin uh, three millimeters four and a half millimeters uh, in size uh, there are also external processors and accessories i wear uh, the, these two uh, let me the the first one is an over-the-ear and all the manufacturers have kind of strange names for these, but MedL calls this a sonnet processor. Uh, and uh, it has these disposable batteries that last, uh, actually for me, they last about three days. Uh, two batteries uh, will last three days. And it uses a size six, A675, which costs about 40 cents each. You can actually get them once cheaper, but it's a special battery. It's a, a standard hearing aid size battery, but it's a, a special one that actually can put out higher current uh, designed particularly for cochlear implants. So uh, I buy the special ones on uh, Amazon and, and coming up a batch of about 60 at a time, I think. Uh, it also will take rechargeable batteries, again, a 675 size, 675 size, and those will last up to about 16 hours. Uh, you have to take them out of the uh, processor and put them in an external charger. 
in this case. Now, the, the later versions of the Sonnet processor, I believe, uh, uh, have come with rechargeable batteries built in, and you can recharge them in the um, device. Actually, uh, I'll, I'll ask if that's the case uh, when we get to the Q&A. Uh, the other unit I wear, this is the one I wear most of the time. And this just, with the Sonnet, you wear a device over the ear and then the uh, inductive coupling loop and magnet is where you, what you put over the transplant, which is up on the side of your head. In the Rondo, which Medel calls it, uh, the, everything is in this device. There's nothing over your ear. There's no wire to uh, connect to the loop. And it came with a charging pad. So it's rechargeable. And uh, I put it on the pad overnight. It recharges in about four hours and uh, on a full charge will last 16 to 18 hours. And it's just uh, foolproof <laughs> and worry free. I really like it. Uh, they have a new version of this, uh, which has more processing and more uh, uh, directivity, which I'm action very anxious to get. Uh, in addition, uh, it came with, uh, and all of these things came with the package that I got from the audiologist after the surgery. They call this an audio link. And it's in a charging base, which you charge from the AC uh, AC circuits, AC sockets. And uh, it also uh, can plug into your TV and then uh, it will beam uh, uh, wirelessly signals directly to the sonnet. Out of the base, uh, this microphone uh, can be used as a a microphone that uh, I use in restaurants and dining rooms where I can put it next to somebody or my wife uh, can be wearing it uh, clipped to her blouse or on a lanyard. Uh, and then it'll beam, uh, pick up her voice in a microphone here and beam it to the sonnet, uh, which is very nice, uh, particularly in noisy environments. And then uh, through that, I can control with my iPhone the settings of both uh, the Sonnet and the Rondo. Uh, the new versions of the Sonic and the Rondo uh, don't need this microphone to beam directly. Uh, there are three main suppliers of cochlear implant in uh, plant devices in the United States uh, that provide devices in, in the United States. Uh, one is Cochlear Limited, which is headquartered in Sydney, Australia. MedL, which is the one I have, uh, is headquartered in Innsbruck, Austria, and Advanced Bionics, uh, which is in Switzerland. Uh, there are several other smaller uh, providers that if you uh, go to Stanford or some of these other places, these are the ones that they usually will offer. They all have similar capabilities, uh, but various features and applicability, and uh, some are better, uh, like preserving uh, residual hearing, uh, I find some like, uh, I think cochlear kind of leads the technology in terms of the, the latest uh, applications, uh, latest features, um, but the others always catch up within a reasonable time. Doctors and audiologists will help the patient select the brand and model that meets the patient's needs, but also the doctors will tend to have their own personal favorites, which they uh, are most comfortable installing uh, and doing the surgery for. MedL was selected in my case because I, they, they wanted to try to preserve the residual, residual hearing. I'll say it didn't work. <laughs> it did uh, for a while. 
uh, I could, uh, it came with a, uh, like a hearing aid that went into my ear as well as the uh, cochlear implant. But the problem was that uh, I was still losing my hearing, uh, age related. And so that kind of went away. I think if I had it to do over, I wouldn't go that route. Um, but it didn't complicate things much. Uh, and I mentioned before, MedL was the first to enable MRIs without removing a uh, magnet in the implant. Uh, not that that's a tremendous deal because to remove the magnet, it's a very small incision. And uh, uh, that uh, it's, it is a nice feature that you don't have to have any kind of surgery uh, to get an MRI. How much did this cost? Well, uh, you probably see this a lot, but the, the hospital charged $185,000 for this. Our health net, Medicare and the health net uh, advantage program, Medicare advantage program paid about 46,000. Uh, and I had to pay $25, which was the uh, uh, meeting with the surgeon uh, before the surgery. Then in addition, the tests, uh, the, the, the all the audiologists and all the devices that were supplied, the hospital billed uh, uh, 12,000 for, the insurance paid about 2,000 and uh, I paid about 7,500. So the total cost of this surgery, and remember this was back in 2018, uh, was about $200,000, of which the insurance paid uh, about 50,000, and I paid about 100. Uh, it, re it really makes you wonder about uh, the poor people who don't have uh, Medicare uh, or who don't have insurance at all. Uh, this is the bill they get from the hospital. Now, I don't think anybody ever actually pays that, but it's kind of a shame that this game is being played uh, throughout medicine uh, in our country today. So in conclusion, I'd like to uh, mention just out of interest that on our chapters board, uh, I think when I uh, counted this up, there were six of our 12 board members who have cochlear implants. Four have them on both sides. All six are enthusiastic supporters of cochlear implants. Uh, we would all strongly recommend that uh, someone who needs it would get it. Anyone who thinks they might need hearing aids or whose hearing aids are no longer sufficient should see an audiologist an ear, nose, and throat specialist, and then get hearing aids or cochlear implants if that's justified. The longer they wait, the more they struggle to hear, and the more they miss of life. The older you get, the harder it is for your brain to adapt to hearing aids or to cochlear implants. Hearing loss can contribute to dementia since those with hearing loss tend to avoid social situations, avoid telephone calls, avoid going out, and they become isolated. So that's my uh, presentation. I'd be happy to entertain questions and I would uh, encourage you to use the raise, raise hand feature uh, in the reactions uh, tab at the bottom. After we take questions about my presentation, I'd like to uh, also invite comments from others uh, who may, may want to talk about their own experiences. So let me see if I can figure out how to stop sharing. There. Uh, so are there any questions about my presentations? Uh, Robert, uh, go ahead. Yes. <clears throat> When we went into this to get our cochlear, Bob, you muted. No, I'm not. No, but yeah, it's call? very hard to hear you, Bob. Okay, let me. Uh, 
adjust this here. Maybe we, uh, why don't we move on to Carol and uh, while Bob's trying to fix his problem. Go ahead, Carol. Um, hi. hi. My question, <laughs> my question is about telecoil. My understanding is they come with telecoil and I didn't know if you had used it or what your experience with it is. Well, uh, I use it a lot and I just didn't know the difference. So you use it with the cochlear implant or uh, hearing? No, aids? I don't. I don't have cochlear implants, but I'm on the cusp of having to make that decision. But I use um, telecoil at home with my TV and different devices, and it really works well for me. But I, but having cochlear implants, I have no clue. Yes. Uh, well, I'll I'll say that in my own case. Uh, I felt felt that the telecoil in my cochlear implant uh, worked the same as it did with my hearing aids before, that uh, there really wasn't any difference. Uh, I don't use it uh, very much because like when I watch TV, we turn on the captions uh, and uh, that along with my cochlear implant and, and other ear, uh, I can understand fine. Uh, in addition, when we go to movies, a lot of people don't realize this, but uh, you can get a, in most movie theaters, a caption device that mounts in your uh, drink cup in the arm of your movie theater seat, and you, you found a gooseneck, so you can position it just below the screen, and then you have real-time captions. And my wife, who has uh, good hearing, uh, will often in a movie theater lean over and say, what did they say? <laughs> yeah, um, they, the, the movie theaters now have those glasses where the caption appears. Oh, yes. On the glass. Yeah. But, but, I, but even with captions, I love to hear clarity. And that's why I'm hooked well, <laughs> to it, telecoil. But at any rate, you're saying it works the same way. Because I had heard that Canso 2 didn't have telecoil. I don't know what Canso 2 is, but there was some problem with that. I don't know either. Uh, I, but I, I do know that uh, a number of the cochlear implant devices and uh, also hearing aids uh, have Bluetooth that you can... Uh, uh, beam directly to your hearing aids or cochlear implant. Uh, uh, TVs are coming now that have Bluetooth built in. Uh, so a lot of this is uh, getting easier. The, the other thing is there's a new Bluetooth becoming available, which you may have heard of, which is in the past, Bluetooth has been device to device. And if you had five devices, they all had to be able to pair separately and use separate channels of Bluetooth. They're now coming out with a broadcast Bluetooth where like in an auditorium or something, one uh, speaker could be using Bluetooth and it would broadcast to everybody who had Bluetooth in the audience on a single channel. Uh, and uh, that is actually going into hearing aids and into practice now. It's going to take, I figure, five or 10 years before it has very wide penetration. But I can't wait till they get it into airports because I can't understand a thing that the gate agent is announcing in an airport. Bob, did, did, you, did you get your problem fixed? I think so. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. So when we both went to have our cochlear implant surgeries, I really didn't know a lot about it. So in retrospect, is there something that you wish you'd known before you had the surgery? Uh, well, I, I guess if I had to do it over again, I wouldn't mess with the uh, uh, trying to do the hybrid thing where it uses the existing hearing 
residual hearing and the uh, cochlear implant. Uh, I, I think I probably also would have gone with uh, a cochlear manufacturer rather than Medel because their technology was ahead. Now Medel is caught up, but at the time uh, I think they were ahead and uh, that for me would have been a better solution. But the the surgeon may have been able to talk me out of that. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Ken, Ken, do you uh, go ahead? Yes, thank you, Larry. That was excellent. I really appreciate it. Um, the question I have is you had your first testing in July of 2018. What was the date of your surgery then? Uh, was it, it was uh, June of uh, 2019. Oh, okay, so what was the length of time um, between when you had your surgery and when the testing was, when you got 100% on those tests? Uh, it was basically a year. A year. Now, is that... I guess you sort of minimize the, the transition of hearing after you got the, the things went pretty smoothly for you. you. You could hear pretty well fairly soon afterwards. Weren't there any, um, what is the normal, were you better than most is what I'm trying to get at? In other words, were you a quicker responder than most people or what's your I thought? I think so. I think uh, the audiologist would have uh, classified me uh, classified me as a star pupil. <laughs> yes, and that was uh, not only because, first of all, I I I wasn't suffering from uh, old age very much. Uh, my brain was still very active; it was just my hearing was going, and. Uh, and my knowledge of the tech, of electronics and my motivation was very high. Uh, you know, I wanted I wanted everything. I wanted to understand it. And uh, whatever exercises she said, uh, I gladly did. In fact, uh, Elliot Turbo, are you still there, Elliot? Uh, was my mentor. Uh, through this, and I'd like to say he has them on both sides as a result of Meniere's disease, and uh, so he had these and then heard, uh, uh, actually, I think through our wives, that I was uh, uh, probably going to need a cochlear implant, and so he offered to mentor me through the process, and uh, as a result, got me involved in HLIA Peninsula chapter <laughs> and on the board. And uh, uh, that was very helpful to know someone that had been through the, the process. And the second question is, what, what about music? Very good question. Uh, music, I can still enjoy. I have not, I have not uh, trained on it. And I'm sure I do a lot better if I had worked at it. Uh, but I also think I, uh, Bob Hall is a, a good example of, of course, he's a musician, uh, much more than I ever was, uh, uh, but he hears music fine. And, uh, uh, but mine's getting better with time, and, but I, I, I think I really should practice it. And the way you practice it is listening to music that you already know uh, by performers you already know and uh, after a while, that will start sounding natural. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. David McClure. Hi. I appreciate the talk, Larry. It's very timely. I was just approved last Thursday for a cochlear implant. And we'll have a surgery on November 9th. I'm a little confused on the process of deciding among the three manufacturers. I was wondering if there's any kind of resources online or otherwise it would help the decision process for uh, making up my mind among the three manufacturers. The, uh, Stanford is being very neutral. They're basically providing information without a recommendation. Well, that, uh, that would speak to me that you don't have any particular physiology or a doctor who prefers one device over another. Because Apparently. I think so they would tell you, but... Uh, I I, uh, I really can't speak to that. I wish that there's another answer to Bob's question. I think I would have done more research about the devices. Yeah. 
when you're going in, you know nothing. And, uh, and so it's very hard to compare. It's very hard to know what, uh, what's important and what's not. Uh, I may make uh, a comment yeah. about this. Yeah, uh, go ahead. When I was going to get my implant, they gave me the, the promotional materials for all three of them and told yeah. me to read them. Yeah. Tell me which one you want. But when I talked to the doctor before the surgery, he says, I don't want to do that one. I have trouble with it. I don't want to do this one. I don't think it works very well. I've had to take one out. And this is the one I want you to use. I said, mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> I got just the opposite from both the audiologist as well as the surgeon. Yeah. Being scrupulously neutral. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, a good question. If you find an answer, let us know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Dave, uh, do you plan on using a hearing aid in your other? This is Ann Thomas. Do you plan on using a hearing aid in your other ear, or are you thinking that you're going to get another cochlear implant? No, I, I uh, right now it appears that the hearing in one ear is good enough that uh, with a hearing aid for profound hearing loss. I can continue to use the one ear with a CI in the other ear. So one consideration that you might want to look at, Advanced Bionics is the parent company is Sonova. Yeah. Sonova owns Advanced Bionics and also owns Phonak. Right. And because of that parity, they're the only cochlear implant processor that has a hearing aid that the cochlear implant actually communicate together. Yeah. So if you turn up the volume on your processor, it automatically does it on the hearing aid. And none of the other um, implants do that. The way the cochlear does that is through the, the phone app. Uh, you can adjust both simultaneously. <laughs> So they're they're working with sound in a similar way. Yeah. So there it's just not fully integrated. Yeah, that's right. I agree. And mm -hmm. I have a, a comment to Carolyn. Carolyn, you asked what the can Canso is. Canso is that's the name for Cochlear Americas off the ear cochlear implant. Mm -hmm. And they didn't put a telequil in the off the ear implant, but they have it in a portable microphone that you can use with the uh, Canso. Thank you, Ann. I, I should mention that uh, I, for a while, used uh, one of my hearing aids in my right ear, uh, but then the hearing and it kept going down at the high frequencies, and I decided it really wasn't making much difference. Now I don't use anything in my right ear. Uh, but I am considering getting a cochlear implant on the other side. Uh, please, do you have a question or a comment? Yeah. Uh, so first, thank you for the presentation. Uh, this is actually really relevant to what I'm going through right now. So I have two hearing aids in both ears, and I'm considering to get cochlear implants for my right ear because my last appointment with the audiologist said it's now eligible for cochlear implant. And um, so I have kind of two questions. Uh, the first one is, when you had the cochlear implant uh, installed and processed and everything, uh, did you lose your sense of where sound came from? Or were you still able to kind of know where sound came from? And then my second question is, um, if there's any damage to the cochlear implant that's inside the ear, uh, how is repair done? Do they have to do another surgery? Um, so I don't, uh, not, a, not being a surgeon, I don't know the answer to the, uh, the latter question. Uh, uh, but I would say that the, uh, I, I didn't mention that not everybody qualifies uh, just because they're deaf for a cochlear implant. If you have nerve damage, uh, it depends on what causes your hearing loss. And if it's nerve damage or other things, uh, the cochlear implant won't help, but there are other types of implants that can help. Uh, I, I found that even wearing hearing aids, 
I had, as it got worse and worse, I lost my sense of, of noise source location. I couldn't tell where the noise was coming from. Somebody yelled, Larry, uh, no idea. And now with actually, you know, just sort of one good ear with the cochlear implant and the other one, I have no idea. And it's frustrating because I love to look at airplanes flying over. Yeah. <laughs> I can't, can't find it. But uh, I, the, everyone I've talked to uh, with cochlear implants or with serious hearing loss corrected with hearing aids have trouble on uh, direction location. Uh, Audrey, uh, do you want to? Everyone, I, uh, well, one, thank you, Larry, for your wonderful presentation. This is actually my first meeting at an HLAA um, Zoom. And yeah, I had basically emailed the board last week saying, hey, uh, I just got a cochlear implant. My cochlear rep was actually the one that suggested that I find a community of people who basically understand what it's like to, you know, be hard of hearing. Um, and so I'm very happy to be here. I just wanted to quickly come off mute and introduce myself. Um, you know, I have, uh, I have two young kids, a mom of two, we're located in Foster City. Um, as I said, I just got a cochlear implant implanted um, in mid-August, actually on my wedding anniversary. <laughs> and I told my husband, this is, this is what marriage is about. <laughs> um, and so everything is very, very fresh for me. Um, so David, Cleese, I'm very, very happy to talk to you about any kind of decision-making process as you go into it. Um, for me, my surgery was actually like a split second thing I had to commit to. My surgeon um, is on paternity leave right now. And so initially I didn't think I was having surgery until next year, uh, but then they called when I was at Disneyland actually with my kids and they said, hey, somebody canceled their procedure. Do you want that slot? And I, I basically, um, okay, because, you know, I want to hear my daughter when she starts to talk. Um, and so, yeah, I ended up going with cochlear, happy to kind of talk through all the different considerations. Um, it can seem very, very daunting. I think, uh, Larry, your experience, you were very lucky that you had a surgeon who was so compassionate and able to kind of talk you through it. My whole experience was very hands-off. They were almost too nonchalant. I was like um, a little bit nervous myself going into it, absolutely terrified. Um, so I, I understand what that feels like as it's still very fresh. Um, but yeah, just wanted to say hi and thank you all for having me. Well, congratulations, uh, Audrey, on your success. And uh, where did you get your, uh, where was your surgery done? Um, I, I had my surgery done at UCSF. That's a good place. Any other questions? Yes. I'd like to to uh, introduce myself. My, I'm Phyllis Walker, and I also went to UCSF. And I set up a comparison chart and tried to figure out which one I should choose. And finally, I became frustrated. I couldn't really see that much difference between the brands. So I asked the audiologist that was helping me, which one would you choose? And and he f uh, flat out said he would choose Cochlear America. So I, I chose Cochlear America and I have one CI and my other ear is a hearing aid. And the re reason why Cochlear America was uh, recommended to me was because it syncs with the resound uh, which is what I had uh, in the hearing aid in my good ear. So that can be a reason why you choose one brand over another. Yes, and I, I guess we should point out that uh, once you make the decision of a brand, it's not easy to switch. Uh, once that implant is under the skin, they've got you, uh, you're their customer. And uh, uh, I asked at one time, because they come out with an update uh, for my uh, processor. And I said, well, I'd like to up update, uh, how much would that cost? And the answer was $10,000 uh, as compared to waiting for Medicare to pay for it, where, where it doesn't cost me 
anything. And and the other thing is, I'm sure Medicare only pays like twenty five hundred or something for it, rather than ten thousand dollars. So again, it's this game uh, that they play. Uh, Kenneth, can you? Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I I was very impressed when you said that you had a mentor, and I think you said Bob was your mentor. No, uh, El uh, Elliot. Oh, Elliot. I'm sorry, Elliot. Okay. So the, 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 I think that brings up a really good uh, point about what I think our chapter can be offering too, is I like the concept of a mentor-mentee relationship with people going through difficult decisions or even just getting oriented to what it's like to having a hearing disability. So I think we can talk about that possibly in the future about uh, with new members actually having a member of the uh, of this uh, of the chapter be their uh, mentor, so it's just something to talk about. Yeah, uh, Sarah. Um, hi, thanks for your presentation. You mentioned uh, the score you needed on the word recognition test to qualify. I have a cochlear implant. By the way, I have a Cochlear America cochlear implant here and a resound hearing aid. So I believe that percentage has changed, making it possible for more people to qualify. So instead of having to have only 40% available, you can have less than 60%. That's what I understand. Well, yes, I, I suspected that those numbers were changing. There's also, there's a difference about whether it's masked or unmasked when they test you. Uh, that means, is it in noise or is it uh, without noise? Uh, and I think, uh, I think Medicare will judge by both of those numbers. Anyone else? Well, thank you all. Uh, you see something, Janie? Okay. All right. Well, thank you all for your attention and your questions. And uh, are there any last minute comments or? Oh, Sarah, your hand is still up, I think. Uh, I'll turn it back to Sally. Thank you, Larry. Good. Well, Larry, that was uh, really amazing. I've had my cochlear implants of the first one in 2006 and the last one in 2017 I learned more from you <laughs> things than I have often heard from the professionals doing the work but anyhow thank you so much Larry being an engineer I'm sure helps you a lot to understand things that some of us don't understand um I would I also like to make a, just a couple of comments that yes uh you may not qualify the first time. That happened to me and I was devastated because it took me quite a while to get up the courage to go and be tested. And I was hearing just a little too well at that time. But my doctor said, come back in a year, Sally. You'll probably qualify then. And I did and that's what happened. So um, the fear of, can I actually get one and Will I hear better? And then being disappointed if you're not um, a candidate at that time can be discouraging. But for most of us that have hearing loss, we know that we lose our hearing more as time goes on. And uh, so don't let that discourage you if you're thinking about it. Uh, at this time in my life, I am uh, essentially deaf and uh, my two cochlear plans are my lifeline to the hearing world. I'm not a tech person. I do not use any additional devices other than my two cochlear implants. And I probably would hear better if I use some of them, but I don't feel the need for it. So those of you who maybe are not tech people, tech oriented, or you feel scared by the technology, um, I'm here to tell you, my two cochlear implants are the only equipment that I use and I can hear pretty darn well and I'm so grateful. So those are just a few comments that I wanted to add. And um, 
Yes, we have, I think we have about eight people in our chapter actually with CIs. And uh, Ken's, Ken Peters um, has recently joined the board and he's uh, helping uh, Kate with membership ideas and the whole chapter we're looking at, how can we increase our uh, membership and um, in services like these. This is what I would call an in-service as a nurse. <laughs> um, are certainly ways to let more people know what resources are available through meetings like this and through HLAA in general. So um, thank you, uh, Ken, for your interest in um, being more involved in our chapter and helping us look at in, uh, additional ways to um, make HLAA known in our community and for people to get involved in our chapters. Um, there are uh, other chapters around the Bay Area, as uh, you see some of the chapter presidents are here today. And uh, it's an amazing organization. I have to say that I have learned more through HLAA about my hearing loss than I ever did in any other way, including with the professionals, and I happen to be a nurse. Um, so it's an amazing organization, and um, I'm all, I'm very happy that so many of you are here today. Um, are there other comments that people would like to make? Uh, we are going to just, just speak a little bit in our chapter at the at the very end about a couple of things, announcements, but um, some of you may not want to stay for that. Are there other things that anyone would like to comment about, about CIs or about um, anything we've talked about today? I had a question. Um, I know that there's, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Anne. Well, anyway, I know that there's research going on at the Mayo Clinic about a totally implantable CI. And since Larry's interested in um, technology, I just didn't know if you were following that. Um, no, I'm not, I'm not aware of that. Uh... Okay. I, I can put a link in chat if you want, but... I don't know where it is in development.